uh, welcome everyone. Good morning. And uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Serventi, for uh, uh, helping us with this process. Uh, thank you for your presentation. We are really looking forward uh, uh, to this. Uh, our college historically has been uh, you know, very much um, um, uh, heavy on research side, and uh, we would like to continue that way. And uh, looking forward to your uh, perspectives on that. So, and uh, once again, I echo uh, Dr. Chelia uh, and thanking Dr. Wheeler to uh, you know organize this. So, Dr. Wheeler, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We are um, all very excited uh, that you are here with us today. I want to thank the NEH for the interest that they've shown in the work that we do here in North Texas, and especially to Jennifer, Jennifer Cerventi um, for uh, her really tremendous support in helping us to pull this together. I also want to thank uh, Adam Chavez and Janine Price Henry for their uh, support and um, efforts to um, work through um, sort of the logistics of putting this together. Um, we have had a tremendous yes. response, and that is why we're using um, a web uh, seminar uh, format today. We have had 94 um, registrants for this uh, event, so we're really excited about that. So now I'll turn it over to Jennifer Cervente. Um, thank you very much, Jennifer, mm -hmm. and we look forward to your presentation. Yes. Well, thank you. And um, yes, I am Jennifer Cerventi from the Office of Digital Humanities at the National Endowment for the Humanities. And I want to add my thanks to the entire team at the University of North Texas, but particularly Dr. Wheeler, uh, Dr. Chavez, Dr. Price Henry for organizing this event. The, the turnout has been tremendous. This is actually the largest turnout that we've ever had for one of our uh, virtual workshops. Um, I'm thrilled to be here today. Travel is limited. Um, and when we put out the word that we were going to be able to offer these virtual workshops, we didn't know what the response would be. And we have been gratified um, that institutions have stepped up and said, yes, I will host um, an event for you. And so we were, we were quite thrilled to see Dr. Wheeler um, indicate interest and to do the work of reaching out to, to other institutions in the area. I know that we have representatives from outside of the University of North Texas as well. And I think that speaks very well to um, the strength of the humanities and, and the work that, um, um, and the interest of the NEH um, in, in, in reaching all of you. So, so thank you for having me. And why don't we get started? Um, before we sort of launch into the slide deck, though, I, I do want to talk a little bit about how we're going to handle questions. Um, we do have the chat feature enabled. Um, I'm going to ask if you have questions, if you could put them in the chat, you can put them in as they occur to you and um, or wait until the very end. What I am going to do, though, is hold responding to those questions until the very end, because we may actually answer your question later on in the presentation, but just so that you don't forget, if you have a question, feel free to add it into the chat box um, and we will try to get to it um, um, during the question and answer period at the end of the presentation. So um, uh, why don't we get started? So I always start any presentation about the NEH with a definition of the humanities. Um, and to show you the, the definition that NEH uses, this is the definition that's in our enabling legislation. It's, it's a list of disciplines, but it is also a, a way and method of, of, of approaching uh, questions, interpretation, methodology. Um, I also want to call your attention to the fact that it includes this history, criticism, and theory of the arts, and um, uh, the, the parts of the social sciences that have humanistic content or employ humanistic methods. So the lines are not as bright as one might think between our sister agencies, the National Endowment for the Arts and the National Science Foundation. There are sort of there are projects that are squarely within NSF's purview, other projects that are squarely with any within NEA's purview. But if you have a question, if you come from one of those disciplines that is fortunate enough to straddle um, the missions of various federal agencies, it's always worth reaching out to us to see if your question might, or to see if your project rather, might fit within the NEH. It's a very capacious definition. And I think that holds, that works well for us. It means that we can support a lot of different sorts of projects with wide ranging sorts of questions and across a, a number of different disciplines as well. Um, 
uh, I, I try every time I do one of these presentations, I update uh, this number as we announce new awards. But since 1965, when the NEH began, we have supported more than 66,000 awards. Um, and that's and I think that speaks to the strength of the humanities in this country. Um, we started small as an agency. We're now um, one of the largest funders of the humanities in the country. Um, and um, the types of projects range from very small projects, reading and discussion groups um, in a rural community to really large longstanding projects like um, uh, the papers of George Washington or the um, that have been funded for many years. So in the 66,000, um, it, it, includes large and small in all states in the uh, and territories in this country in all communities um, and a range of different types of humanities projects as well but you're here to 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 learn about how to to tap into the funds that neh as a granting agency has to offer you and i will be talking about um, uh, a number of the the funding programs that we do have Something to keep in mind, though, the NEH is organized uh, uh, around programs and uh, program divisions and offices, often with the types of audiences or the types of projects that are funded. We're not organized by disciplines like some of our sister agencies. We are organized um, by, by these, uh, what you see in front of you, uh, digital humanities, public programs, education programs. Um, so it's more about audience and, and type of project. Um, and all of the offices and divisions fund across the different disciplines of the humanities as well. But today I'm going to be speaking primarily about these four, which is not to say that in the chat you can't ask questions about the other ones as well. And um, during this presentation, I'll also talk with you about how you can sort of keep up with what um, my colleagues and other offices and divisions are doing as well, because some of them um, might have programs that, that speak to your particular needs. But let's let's launch right in and sort of uh, uh, get an introduction to what NEH does through our various funding opportunities. Um, I am in the Office of Digital Humanities, but I do want to stress that what we what might be considered a digitally inflected project or a digital project happens across the agency. The Office of Digital Humanities has a particular mission, um, but uh, projects like digitizing collections, they don't happen in the Office of Digital Humanities, even though both have the word uh, or, or form of a word of digital in it. Digitizing collections happens in our Division of uh, Preservation and Access. So because of that, um, my colleague Sheila Brennan has put together um, a guide um, to the various funding opportunities that can support different flavors of digital projects. Um, and you can find that on the Office of Digital Humanities blog. Um, it's a very um, useful guide to, to introduce you to the variety of funding opportunities that support digital projects. And as I mentioned, they are across the agency. So, um, and if you do have any questions about that, we can certainly discuss that a little bit further. I know it, it can be a little confusing. Oh, I have a digital project. Of course, I go to the Office of Digital Humanities. Well, um, I'm, I'm pleased to see um, and to say that digital work happens across the agency and we want you to, to make sure that you find the right program for the types of activities that you're seeking support for. But here we are in the Office of Digital Humanities and our mission is to work across sort of the audiences of the endowment. So we are an office, um, not a, a division, we are an office. And we have in some ways uh, dual missions. One, we want to sort of think about sort of the cultural changes um, that the digital turn has, has introduced to us. And when I say the digital turn, I'm speaking from way back. The, um, the National Endowment for the Humanities has supported what might be called early digital projects or humanities computing since our inception. But we are particularly interested in projects that are exploring new approaches to the use of computational work in the humanities. But on the flip side, we're also interested in um, projects that are studying digital culture from a humanistic perspective. There's a lot that uh, the humanities um, can bring to the table with, uh, with all of the changes that are going on right now um, in what might fall under um, and what we call digital culture. So, um, so it's, it, it's two, two sides of a coin and they need to go hand in hand um, to be responsible um, funders in the humanities in this space. Um, but I'm going to um, 
point out sort of one particular funding opportunity that may be of interest to sort of a, a, a broad range of you in this audience. And that's our Digital Humanities Advancement Grant Program. That's our project-based funding opportunity. And it's the most capacious as well. Um, it can do those computational methods. It can do research on digital culture. It can fund international collaboration on computationally intensive humanities and social sciences. You can do workshops um, to discuss, to bring together people, and these days bring together people virtually as well, to discuss sort of new um, uh, methodologies and best practices. I often um, uh, think of the Office of Digital Humanities. We're the space where um, uh, they're not best practices yet, and it can. This is an opportunity through this particular program. Um, there might be pockets of creativity or innovation happening around the country, but bringing them together to um, to think about how projects may work together, to think about interoperability, scalability, sustainability, those are all good, um, good uses of digital humanities advancement funds. We've also designed this program to be quite flexible in terms of the levels of funding available. There's three levels um, of funding um, that you can apply for. There's also two deadlines a year. There's one in January and one in June. So we ask that you choose the one that fits best with your schedule. You don't have to worry, oh, I missed the January deadline. I have to wait until the next January to apply. No, you can just apply at the June deadline as well. Um, and here's an example of one uh, of a project that was uh, supported at a Texas based institution um, uh, funded through the, a level two digital humanities advancement grant program. And they brought together a question that they had, but that was also of interest to the field. Um, and that was how to study um, uh, floor plans that architecture uh, architects use. So of interest to urban planners, of interest to architectural historians, um, but also sort of thinking of the computational challenges of, uh, of doing automatic floor plan detection. How do you store this particular type of data um, in a, and think about who are the user communities as well. So this is a good example of using sort of a particular collection. And this one, although out of Baylor, was using a particular collection from the University of Texas, so a collaborative sort of project, but also sort of framing the project so that folks who are less interested in Frank Lloyd Wright, but more interested in this particular methodology, they may be from a library that also has architectural um, floor plans, um, to really think about how this can be a uh, of interest to the field as well. So this, this is a good example of they were still at their experimental stage. So they came in for a level two um, to really sort of still continue to work on sort of um, some of the challenges and to take risks. That's what the Digital Humanities Advancement Grant Program is also a space that allows you to take risks and to um, even if you're not as successful as you had hoped, to share the results of your project through that white paper. So all of our projects in the Office of Digital Humanities require a public facing white paper. So you're not just sharing the results of your project, you're also through sort of peer reviewed papers, um, which would be captured through the grant projects, but also a white paper that NEH maintains that really talks about what worked and what didn't work. Things that may have been sort of captured in a final report to the endowment over the years, but really there was not a good mechanism for sharing that publicly. And through this white paper, we are able to do that to the field as well. I do want to point out um, a relatively new program in the Office of Digital Humanities for those of you who have partners or collaborators in the United Kingdom. Um, and that's a, a partnership that we do with the, the NEH sort of uh, uh, analog agency in the UK, the Arts and Humanities Research Council. Um, and it's new directions for digital scholarship and cultural institutions. So museums, libraries, galleries, archives, often um, working with teams um, at colleges and universities as well um, to work collaboratively. They're, they're really interested in, and we're really interested in sort of digital methods um, for cultural institutions. So the way this funding opportunity works is um, you need to have teams from both sides, from both sides of the pond. You need to have a US team and a team from the UK. Um, and um, each country also has to have, as part of their team, a representative from a cultural institution. And I know we have um, folks from museums and libraries here on this call. And so I want to make sure that you're aware of sort of what um, what may be required here. There is a funding um, uh, deadline coming up in July. 
there's two levels of funding available, both planning and implementation. Um, but it's it's a really exciting opportunity um, for the US to fund the US based team and the UK um, funders to fund the U UK team, but we have a much bigger project when the, the teams work together. Um, and here's an example of one um, that was funded out of the University of Texas Austin during the previous round. So it's uh, building on sort of some of the collections, the special collections at the University of Texas Austin, but also with Lancaster University and Liverpool John Moores University. Um, and they're looking at a, Sp a Spanish colonial archive um, and how artificial intelligence um, can sort of open up those collections um, uh, using natural language processing, helping with transcription of very difficult documents using handwritten um, text recognition technology, um, which is sort of a very frontier sort of technology as well. Um, so it's an example of when two funders come together, the projects that are supported are stronger, stronger than if each individual funder were able to support it. Um, so if, if this is something that's of interest to you, if you've already um, been in conversation or already have um, uh, like-minded uh, colleagues uh, that are working out of the UK, take a look at this funding opportunity for you. For those of you in the audience who are like, well, I do, sometimes I do digital stuff, but I don't know if I'd call myself a digital humanities folk person, that's okay. We, we don't have a definition for that. And we know that people move in and out depending on sort of where they are in their career as well. But I do want to sort of point out that the Office of Digital Humanities also has um, what I call the Human Infrastructure Program. It's a professional development program called Institutes for Advanced Topics in the Digital Humanities. And every year we fund a slate of projects, and these are the ones that were funded last year, um, uh, to really help people come up to speed on different methods and approaches in the digital humanities or what comes under the umbrella of digital humanities. So some are on things like uh, crowdsourcing transcription, others on national language uh, uh, for linguistic diversity, some on text analysis, some on archaeology. Um, uh, so you may not see yourself in this slate, you know, like I'm interested in none of those technologies or methodologies, and that's okay. Every year there's a new slate um, for you to take a look at. But I also want to ask for your help. If you see something that might be of interest to one of your colleagues who's not in this meeting, if you could ha share, share that this is an opportunity um, uh, for them. And some of these take place during the summer. Some of these take place during the weekends. Others are a hybrid, a virtual one, and then an in-person one. For example, the one hosted by the Santa Fe Institute is a, a large scale online course to get you started in cultural analytics. And then they'll offer for advanced graduate students and other early career scholars an opportunity once you've completed that um, that large online course um, to possibly come together to continue to work on your own um, sort of research projects with some of the instructors from that um, from that online course as well. So um, my takeaway from this, though, is I hope you see yourself as our target audience. Everyone on this call should see themselves in this space. You have a lot to offer um, and an opportunity for learning um, about new methods, new approaches um, is something that we want you to, to um, uh, consider. Many of these offer stipends for participation or at least per diem and mileage to attend. Um, we don't want it to make a burden for you to attend. We wanna make it a, as open as possible. On the NEH's website under the professional development tab is where you can see if some of them still have openings. Others may be offering it a couple of times during their um, the life of their award. So you may have missed a first deadline, but there may be a second or third deadline as well. It, it, it's worth sort of exploring. And many of these projects are also developing websites where they're putting their curriculum materials online. So if you can't join them in person for the um, or, uh, or participate as a, an institute participant, you still might benefit from exploring the websites for the various um, opportunities as well. I know many of you are faculty and staff who are primarily interested in the division of research programs. I'm under no illusion that many folks, when they talk about having an NEH, they mean having an award from the division of research programs, and that's okay. Um, our division of research programs um, uh, supports scholars, both individuals and collaborative teams that are working on research projects. And when we say research projects, we mean projects that are um, interested in interpretation, that advance the knowledge and understanding of the humanities. And it is the case that many of the projects that are funded um, in this division go on to inform our other public programs, our other um, uh, opportunities in the Division of Education programs. So the work of the Division of uh, Research Programs can undergird sort of later stages for, for work across the agency as well. 
But a way to think about the division of research programs as you're organizing this in your mind is the division of research programs offers support for individuals um, and they offer support for institutions. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the funding opportunities for individuals first. And the two programs that are probably most familiar to you are fellowships and summer stipends. I also know that in Texas, there are many institutions that would be classified as Hispanic serving institutions or high Hispanic enrollment. Um, and we also have special awards for faculty at those institutions because we recognize um, historically there's been some challenges at those institutions. Um, and we want to make sure that faculty at those institutions can, um, can compete um, well um, uh, for their own research opportunities too. So um, as I talk about the fellowships, if you're at a high Hispanic enrollment institution, also think, oh, that also applies for the awards for faculty. But I um, fellowships up to a year can be six months to a year um, for really research and writing and it can be on any topic within the humanities really at any stage of the project from early research to um, writing the final chapters of the project and here's an example of one that was funded at texas a&m uh, central texas um, just recently and so this is a really wonderful example of political history. And I can see this project being of great interest to not only scholars who do political history, but um, the public in general. I mean, who doesn't love a good uh, uh, LBJ story? And um, I would not be surprised if part of the work that they're doing um, includes uh, uh, work from the LBG light. LBJ library as well. Um, but I think this this is a, a really um, exciting example of a project that's working on contemporary American history. But here's an example of a summer stipend to give you a sense of the range of uh, topics that can be funded. Um, research uh, and preparation for a book on the philanthropic uh, contributions of Spanish women in the 18th century enlightenment. And you can say, oh, what an esoteric topic. Yes, it might be narrow, but you never know what a scholar working in the archives may find that really could open up a whole new area of research. We need as an agency and as a country to continue to fund this sort of work as well. Um, so um, I want to encourage you if you're working, if you're just at the start of a project and you think, oh, this is too narrow for the NEH, it's not too narrow for the NEH. We do really broad projects that appeal to a wide audience, but we also need to support those projects that are just getting started that are across, that are outside of the United States as well. Um, as I often say, the humanities know no boundaries. We need to um, work on projects that um, are of interest because Americans are interested in all types of and disciplines of the humanities as well. So those were the individual ones. Now I also want you to think about institutional ones. And when I say institutional ones, these are the ones that your, um, your institution submits the application on your behalf. And I wanna call your attention in particular to three different um, funding opportunities, in part because two of the three have completely sort of redone their programs in the last couple of years. So what you thought NEH supported may have changed dramatically. So I want you to go back and take a look again. Um, at the collaborative research program, which is a very capacious program in that it has um, four different funding streams. It does um, manuscript preparation, collaborative manuscript preparation, planning for international programs, uh, scholarly editions, and now I'm going to um, uh, forget the fourth one. But there are four different streams for you to take a look at take a look at under collaborative research. They've completely redone their notice of funding opportunity and it's worth having a look at, particularly um, that scholarly digital projects one. Um, and it works really well in tandem with the Digital Humanities Advancement Grant. We're, my office is really sort of the, the building of the infrastructure that many scholars then use to undergird their project in collaborative research. So for example, we have funded Scalar Prod, the Scalar platform um, for uh, digital publishing out of the University of Southern California. Well, a number of scholars, both individuals and through collaborative uh, research projects are using that platform to publish the results of their project. Scholarly Editions and Translations, a very long standing program at the NEH. It is where our founding, uh, founding era projects are supported out of, but they are increasingly interested in sort of born digital scholarly editions and translations, and also projects that you don't have to propose a project that will, that will take 50 years to complete. There are projects um, like the Browning Correspondence at Baylor that will take a long time to complete. But there are other projects in scholarly editions and translations where a team can complete a project um, fairly quickly 
if they have time and space to work together to complete that work. And we want to be able to support that too in the scholarly editions and translations. And then the third program that I want to in, in speak of is the archaeological and ethnographic field research program, in part because it's relatively new. We've only had one deadline. We just announced the awards for that program um, just a, a couple of weeks ago. Um, it is to support field work um, broadly considered, field work in archaeology um, here in the United States and outside of the United States, but also ethnographic field work. So that includes sort of mixed methods, um, that includes oral histories with an eye toward an interpretive project at the end of an interpretive research project. So not just collecting oral histories, but uh, oral histories for um, a research project. But because it's new, I want to invite you to sort of take a look at uh, the funding opportunity for that to see if it might fit with the types of activities that you're seeking support for. So those are the um, uh, projects that I want to highlight in the grants for institutions in the Division of Research Programs. Um, and here's some examples. Here's a scholarly edition and translations project out of Abilene Christian University. Um, and it's a textual history of the Ethiopic Bible. Um, and um, so it's print publication. Um, we still do print publication because they have determined that's the most appropriate sort of publication venue for the audience that they want to reach. But it's uh, translations, uh, transcriptions, but it also has um, the apparatus around it to help scholars and the general public use this work. Um, and that's really what um, defines sort of um, a scholarly editions and translations program. It's in addition to making the base materials available, you need to have that scaffolding around it as well to help use the user community um, that you've identified really get the most out of the materials. Here's an example. Oh, oh, the fourth one is conferences. Thank you. Um, uh, that can be funded through collaborative research. And this is a, a, a project that was funded um, by the collaborative research program before the complete rewrite. But I chose this one as an example, not only because it's from Texas, but because it has, um, it's an example of a type of project that can, can continue to be funded. So a conference and a preparation of an edited volume of essays. Um, and this is an example of one that's in philosophy. Um, and um, so this is one that, uh, uh, it, it, even though it comes from a philosopher, it is um, positioned to be highly interdisciplinary. Um, and um, we think that, um, that it will have um, a great interest across a number of different uh, disciplines as well. So um, this is an example of the type of conferences that can be funded through collaborative research. So different from workshops that are funded through um, the Office of Digital Humanities, different from other sort of uh, reading and discussion groups that are funded um, elsewhere in the agency. This is a scholarly conference and that's what they do in the Division of Research Programs. So let me turn your attention now or turn our attention to the Division of Education programs, um, in part because I know we have uh, representatives from across uh, the University of North Texas and other uh, universities representing disciplines that are adjacent to or that um, are alongside the humanities as well. And I want to call your attention to a number of funding opportunities that may also support that sort of collaborative um, intra-institutional work. Um, so the Division of Education programs is really interested in um, sort of strengthening teaching and learning. And the most flexible funding opportunity that we have in that division is called Humanities Initiatives. Um, it can develop uh, new humanities programs, resources, courses, enhancing existing ones. It can also support projects that are thinking about how to improve teaching and learning on your campus by working with community organizations. Um, uh, it can work with K through 12 organizations um, sort of in your region. It can do bridge programs. It is meant to be quite flexible. Um, the deadline is coming up, so it's worth taking a look at now, but there is a deadline every year, so don't feel like you have to rush to get make this May deadline. Um, we do have separate streams for community colleges, Hispanic serving institutions, um, uh, historically black colleges, universities, tribal colleges and universities, and colleges and universities more broadly. Um, so you choose which of the streams um, that your institution fits into. But because it is so capacious and broad, I want to encourage you to take a look at that notice of funding opportunities. Um, it's really an opportunity also for reading and discussion groups on your own campus um, to improve um, courses, programs on your own campus um, uh, uh, to strengthen um, sort of what is what is taught um, uh, uh, around the humanities. It, it can be um, amazingly broad. 
But I also want to call your attention to a, uh, a different program in um, the uh, Division of Education programs that's focused particularly on the role of humanities in undergraduate um, um, education. Um, it, the deadline is in September. They offer both planning and implementation grants. But what's important to understand about this, uh, the Humanities Connections program, is it needs to involve a partnership um, in your um, institution, one program or department in the humanities, and at least one program or department outside of the humanities. So School of Nursing, College of Information, College of Business, College of Engineering, some really um, exciting sort of projects have come out of that. And let me show you a, a couple. Um, let me show you first uh, one of the humanities initiatives that was just funded out of the University of Texas Health Sciences Center. Um, and it's really sort of a collaborative project, as we, as I say, to collect and archive oral histories of the HIV ep epidemic. So it's an opportunity for medical students, faculty, um, uh, as well as faculty, uh, humanities faculty, um, to work together. Um, they might often not have that opportunity. And this gives you a sense of how flexible that humanities um, initiatives program can be. It can be squarely within the humanities. We've done classics projects. Um, we've done history of the book projects. But it's also flexible enough to allow for these sorts of collaborative projects as well. So that's a humanities initiatives project. Here's an example of a Humanities Connections planning grant. Um, and I like it um, because it is really talking about um, uh, humanities driven STEM. And I think that it will be of tremendous interest to um, certain institutions that are getting a lot of push for STEM on their own campus. Well, we think at the, at the National Endowment for the Humanities, the humanities bring a lot to the table and it's not truly STEM unless the humanities are there as well. Um, and I know we have folks from the Honors College here. This project involves folks from the Honors College. Um, another um, uh, important element of the Humanities Connections Program is planning for sort of uh, student experiential learning as part of it. Um, so they can involve um, uh, working with students on making sure they have internships outside of the campus or working somewhere uh, as undergraduate researchers with faculty members. But um, it's really to, um, to think about developing new programs, new majors, new certificates um, uh, that involve sort of collaboration between the humanities and other parts of the university as well. Um, so that's an example of the humanities connections and planning. And part of the reason that they offer both planning and implementation is because there's often not an opportunity for faculty at these various colleges and universities to speak together, to work together, to do that sort of planning. Um, and so both planning and implementation were built into this program. I also want to talk a little bit about the um, summer programs um, offered by the Division of Education programs. Before I joined the Office of Digital Humanities, I spent many years in the Division of Education programs. I know how important participating in one of these summer programs as summer institutes or landmarks of American history and culture um, can be for revitalizing um, uh, uh, your own research agenda um, or um, how it can be seen as a leadership opportunity for an institution to host one of these and to show sort of what your campus has to offer. Um, so uh, uh, directors apply um, in February of 2022, so you have time to plan for projects that will be offered in 2023, which seems impossibly far away, but is not. Um, and participants would have, uh, will apply in uh, March of 2022 for projects um, in summer of 2022. And every fall, so this upcoming fall 2021, is when they'll announce the slate of opportunities for that. And the Summer Institutes program has a cohort for higher education, advanced graduate students, all the way up to senior faculty, um, as well as K through 12 audiences. And then the landmarks of American history and culture are multiple opportunities for um, K through 12 teachers, often hosted by um, a college or university or a museum or local historic site, but they are focused on American history and culture and really place-based learning. So let me give you a couple of examples for you to think about. This is an example of an institute for school teachers um, that uh, this is the second time they're offering it. Um, they had such a, a nice uh, response the first time, but this is out of the University of Texas El Paso. And it's an institute um, bringing together uh, uh, folks to really um, study sort of uh, tales from the Chihuahuan Desert, um, borderland narratives about identity and binationalism. So I could see this being of interest to um, 
those who teach social studies, those who teach language arts, um, but also even some science teachers who are interested in incorporating humanities perspectives in their um, their high school science classes as well. And thinking about um, if they're teaching geology or if they're teaching um, uh, 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 nature courses, um, I could really uh, see this being a, a, a tremendously of interest. So what I'm asking you to think about is you think about, oh, what could we certainly host? Build on your strengths at your own campus. What do you do well? Do you have a special collection at your university um, library? Or do you have scholars who are leaders in the field in a particular area of the humanities and are willing to bring them to campus? It's a wonderful opportunity to introduce your campus, particularly to K through 12 teachers who will then go back and say, you know, I was on this campus. It's a great place to go. You should consider applying to attend school there. So um, think about what can you do to host one of these um, summer programs um, for either K through 12 audiences or higher education audiences. I also want to point out that um, some of these institutes um, for K, they don't have to happen on your campus. They can happen elsewhere in the United States as well. And so this is an example of a project that was supported through the University of California, Santa Cruz, but they held it in Washington, DC. Um, and it was on sort of museums, humanities in the public sphere. I think living in Washington, DC, I, I really think this is a great example of of bringing together a range of scholars from uh, anthropology, from history, from history of science, um, from uh, history of museums, um, to really think about museums as, as they say, museums as sites of interdisciplinary inquiry. Um, so, but it's being held in Washington. Um, and so what they, what that means is both the faculty and um, the participants uh, spent their spent uh, several weeks in uh, Washington DC sort of exploring this question with re weekly lectures and seminars and and site visits. So those were so I've talked about Office of Digital Humanities. I've talked about the research division. I've talked about the education division. I want to talk a little bit about the Office of Challenge Grants. And this is in particular, I'm glad to see that we also have representatives from public libraries um, sort of in the audience, because this program, I think, will be of particular interest to you. And this is really what I think of as our infrastructure or our bricks and mortar program. Um, and it is also a, a funding opportunity where you have an opportunity to raise additional what we call third party funds. So not, not cost sharing from your own institution, but if you have a friends group that raises funds for you, if you have your office of development um, that is uh, launching a capital campaign, make sure the offerings of the Office of Challenge Grants um, are on your radar screen. They offer both sort of what they call capital awards. So that those are the bricks and mortar if you're redoing um, sort of one of the, the special collections room in your library or classroom settings to build a new digital scholarship center. Um, these are, that's what the Office of Challenge Grants can support. Um, and let me give you, they can also though support what we call digital infrastructure. And this is what's exciting to me in the Office of Digital Humanities in that some projects, some digital projects have now become so important that we would really miss them if they were gone. Um, they are, um, they are, they undergird so much research. They, teachers use them in their teaching and learning. Students have come to rely upon them for say National History Day projects. Um, that if they were to go away, it would really harm sort of the humanities in the United States. So that sort of work as well needs to be supported and we need to think about sort of sustainability for those projects as well. And let me give you a couple of examples of sort of digital infrastructure projects that have been supported through the Office of Challenge Grants. Um, and so here's the, the capital projects and the digital infrastructure projects um, that I just mentioned. But here's an example. And here's an example that comes out of the University of North Texas. Um, they were actually ahead of the game. They received a challenge grant several years ago to um, ensure the long-term support for the portal to Texas history. Um, and I can um, speak from experience how important this site is for um, scholarly research, for, um, for teachers, um, as an example to other states as well. So it is worth, if you don't know the, the portal to Texas history that's on your own campus, it's absolutely worth um, exploring. But I also wanna thank the University of North Texas for realizing that this project cannot be supported by individual grants all the time. That's a risky way of supporting some of these long-term projects. The portal to Texas history is too important um, for, for a number of audiences and it needed to sort of think about long-term support for the project and to sort of reach out to donors um, to say, 
don't you think this is important? Isn't this an a wonderful opportunity for you to also support the humanities? And here's a way to leverage NEH funds. And if you give us this amount of money, it'll unlock some more NEH funds as well. So it's a great way of getting to know new donors who might be interested in supporting the work of the humanities. You might be surprised um, who some of those folks are as well. And having an NEH challenge grant is a great way to, to get them interested in that sort of work. Here's another one. Here's another um, uh, project that has um, sort of has a current challenge grant underway, and that's the Humanities Commons site out of Michigan State University. If you don't know about this project, you should get to know um, get to know it. So uh, search for Humanities Commons um, online, set up your own profile. I think of it as like it's a combination of link scholarly LinkedIn. Um, but also a space for uh, discussion. There are groups on a whole range of topics from East Asian humanities to Slavic studies. Um, it's a great way to share your work. There's a lot of, uh, of syllabi sharing. There's a repository um, uh, attached to it so you can deposit your own open access scholarship to share more broadly. Um, but it's a, a really great way of, of being part of a community, particularly if you are teaching a subject that is, um, you're the only one on your campus who teaches that subject and you really sort of want to be in part of that uh, space. But um, it, it's a combination of a number of different, um, what I think of as um, really important supports for humanity scholarship. Um, but it's a, a networking site, it's a repository site, it's a sharing site. Um, it's a, um, uh, and so set up your profile, let people find you so they can also collaborate with you on your own scholarship as well. And finally, I want to talk about Humanities Texas. Um, can, can folks um, use the raise your hand function? How many of you even um, know about Humanities Texas? Um, good, I'm seeing people raise their hands. Excellent. Um, I cannot, the, for those of you who don't know about Humanities Texas, get to know them. Humanities Texas is our state humanities council. Um, there's a state or territorial humanities council in every sort of territory and, and state um, in the United States. The state councils get a large percentage of our budget every year to do their own humanities work. They are on the ground. They are closest to the American people. They know what their state needs. Humanities Texas is an amazing state council. Um, they um, offer reading and discussion groups. They offer, um, they honor uh, teachers of the humanities across the state. That's one thing that I love about them. I follow them on Facebook, um, not because I live in Texas, because I don't, but because I'm thrilled to see the way they honor teachers um, of the humanities, history, language arts teachers. I think that's so important. They, they do also offer grants for some of your work. So you may um, explore their grants program to see if what you're doing could be supported through Humanities Texas. But um, it's also a great way for you to get involved, to share your own expertise um, um, with them. They're board members, um, signing up to be lecturers, signing up to just help them out in a certain way. They're also, they might be able to do some work to connect your, stu your students with uh, local historical societies and other humanities organizations in the state for internship opportunities as well. So um, I, I want to make sure that if you don't know about Humanities Texas, you get to know them. And in particular, for those of you who are at um, small, um, uh, small institutions, small cultural institutions that are calling in, or that you may know, you, we all have multiple uh, sort of facets of our own personality. You're not just a, a, a scholar. You may work with your local historical society as well. Make sure they know about the winter storm recovery grants, particularly if they had humanities collections that were damaged um, by the, the storm. Um, take a look at that. I, I, I'm imploring you to take a look at it now because the, the window for applying for these funds closes on April 30th. So they got emergency grants from the NEH um, and they are now distributing them um, to institutions across the state of Texas that might have, um, might have had their collections damaged or programs postponed because of the winter storms. So if you could help us get the word out to um, organizations that um, might benefit from, from funds um, because of the winter storm. Thank you. Okay, so I've thrown a ton of stuff at you, all these different programs. The question now becomes, now what? You may have sort of jotted down um, the names of a couple of programs you wanna take a look at. How do you take a look at it? Well, first um, you go to the NEH's website, um, neh.gov, um, and this is what you'll see. Um, uh, this is one of the, the, the rotating screens that we have. 
Um, I do want to call your attention to the fact that the NEH was um, really pleased to um, receive American Rescue Plan funds. So we have the sustaining the humanities for through the American Rescue Plan. So the SHARP programs, we have a number of different funding opportunities, in particular, the grants to organizations. So if you've um, had damage to the humanities because of the pandemic, if you've lost staff, if you've had to let staff go, or if you've lost revenue um, uh, because, of, um, because of the pandemic, please take a look um, at this program. The deadlines are coming up quickly. We wanna get the funds out quickly. We had funds through the CARES Act, which we were also um, quite gratified to have. And we got those funds out relatively quickly. Um, and as a program officer for a number of those awards, I can tell you those awards make a difference. They save people's jobs. And that's what we want to do with the American Rescue Plan as well. So take a look at the funding opportunities. Those are different from our regular funding opportunities. So none of the things that I talked about earlier have at all anything to do with the American Rescue Plan, but I want to make sure that you know about it because we just announced it a couple of weeks ago. So each institution gets to have one, one application, um, but it's a great way to sort of replace funds that may have been lost for the humanities because of the pandemic um, and because of sort of reprioritizing. We want to make sure the humanities um, are still prioritized at your institution. But um, when you go to the NEH website, you, this is what you'll see. And on the top right hand side, you'll see grants, news, our work and about. And I'm going to spend most of our time talking about what's under the grants tab. So once you click on the grants tab, this is what you'll see. Um, this is a way that you'll be able to search all of the grant programs. You'll be able to search the past awards as well. And all of those examples, those screenshots that I did, that's by, that I found those by searching our past awards, our publicly, uh, our public facing database of funded projects. And so um, when you um, click on that search all past awards, this is the database of funded projects. So if you're looking for collaborators, you can search it in a, a variety of ways. Um, if you're looking for a speaker for your campus, it's a great way of fun finding an NEH funded project. If you have to do an environmental scan as part of your application to NEH or bibliography, this is not the only place you should go, but it's a great place to start. Um, it's also a place where you can find links to the white papers of those funded projects that I mentioned from the Office of Digital Humanities um, as well. Um, so it, it becomes richer um, every day because um, people, uh, awardees are uploading their white papers, they're uploading links to their um, the grant products. Um, that uh, that were funded. So citations, um, if you win a Pulitzer, um, which are one of our uh, uh, NEH fellowships did not too long ago, you'll find that as a link to um, uh, within the uh, database of funded projects. Um, and that's where you'll find sort of the links to the white papers and um, also some additional information about sort of how to how to navigate through the different sorting options as well. Okay, so I'm back to the grants page. Um, and I'm now I'm going to click on the search all grant programs, and you'll get sort of a long list of funding opportunities. And you may have sort of noted a few programs that were of interest, and you're going to click on the one that is of particular interest to you. And what you'll find is this what I call the program landing page. And because I'm in the Office of Digital Humanities, I chose the Digital Humanities Advancement Grant Program landing page. Um, and this is where you'll find what I call what is known as the grant snapshot. So you'll find when the applications are available, when they're due, um, when the expected notification date is, which is really important as you think about sort of how to time your project. It also will tell you if that particular program will read a draft. It's where you'll find links to program webinars or links to sign up for a program webinar that's coming up. Um, so a, a really in-depth dive into that particular program. It's also where you'll find that notice of funding opportunity, which in previous years used to be called the uh, grant guidelines. It's now called the notice of funding opportunities, but it serves the same purpose. It's what you should use and it's what document you should always use to and refer back to as you're preparing an application to that particular program, because each program is different. Um, and so you want to make sure you're using the right funding um, opportunity for that particular program. And as part of that funding opportunity, um, you'll find our evaluation criteria. And I always tell folks when I'm working with them, as you're writing your application, the evaluation criteria is the most important part of any notice of funding opportunity. Um, because this is what you're writing your application toward. Um, if you don't sort of speak to these review criteria, it really lowers your chance of receiving an award. And we are trying um, to align our application narrative, so the application components, to that review criteria. 
Um, and, and so as you're writing, and it, it should come as no surprise to you that we always start with the intellectual significance and impact of the project for the humanities first. Um, uh, that's across the agency. Um, if it's not really squarely within the humanities, if you've not made that case in any application to the NEH, um, you're not going to be able to get funded. But the rest of the review criteria is really um, program specific. And that's why you want to make sure you find the right program for the types of projects that you are seeking funding for. So, for example, my office really sort of um, is interested in sort of how how is what you're proposing um, uh, uh, sort of speaks to the appropriate appropriateness of methodology and use of technology um, mitigating risk those are really important for this particular program those might be less important for other programs but other programs might have other um, review criteria that speaks to their particular program needs so make sure that you closely read and make notes on the um, review criteria as you're preparing your application so I always leave folks um, with uh, 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 ways to think about sort of how do I find the right program, um, sort of use the NEH staff, make sure you know about grants.gov, all of our applications come through grants.gov, so make sure you know how the submission will work for that particular program. It's, it's in the notice of funding opportunities, but you should um, make sure as you're reading that notice, um, sometimes you as an individual, if you're applying for an individual, need to register with grants.gov. Other times, the application comes through sort of the authorized person at your institution. Um, it's rare for an institutional award it, it, that the project director applies. So you need to um, make sure you find out who, who on your campus, who in your institution will be responsible for submitting the application. Always read the notice of funding opportunities. Also, always read some of the samples that we've put up. We've put up samples of previously funded projects to give you a sense of how those that were successful sort of made the case to the peer reviewers. You've already made sort of the done the first step, which is to participate in or, or watch those webinars. Um, and I'm not the only, I should not be the only webinar that you ever watch from any age, frankly. Um, uh, we have a whole list of webinars um, from some of our different programs um, for different audiences as well. We have some uh, ones that are happening this spring. We have ones, if you want a, an even deeper dive into digital projects, we have some uh, one just for digital projects that my colleague Sheila Brennan will be hosting on May 8th. Um, and so you can sign up for that if you go to the NEH website. And of course, you should contact the NEH with questions. Um, uh, I work with some wonderful colleagues part of our job is to help you find the right program. So if you think of this as sort of a loop, um, finding the right program and contacting the NEH with questions um, should be sort of a, a reinforcing circle. Um, oftentimes when I am speaking to someone, I will say, after hearing what you're seeking funding for, I think there's a better NEH program for you. Let me introduce you to my colleagues in that division. Um, we are a small federal agency. I'm happy to make those introductions. Um, um, there's not, we can't help you once you submit an application. Our goal is to have you contact us before you submit an application so that we can talk to you and make sure that you found the right program and that we can answer any questions that you may have. And if possible for that particular program, even offer to read a draft um, of your application and, and offer some comments on that with, with just fresh set of eyes. It doesn't count toward sort of the application. You don't get any pluses. Um, as part of your uh, application, but it's sometimes you've been working on a project for so long, you're so deeply into it, things that may seem, seem obvious to you may not seem obvious to the reviewers. And in fact, um, we always, uh, when I'm reading drafts, I always try to remind um, those that I'm working with, remember who's going to be reading it. It's going to be both specialists, but also generalists. Our national, our count, our National Council on the Humanities members represent a huge range of different disciplines. We have both the specialist peer review and um, the National Council. Avoid jargon, which is not to say that you can't use technical language. I work in a division um, that has a lot of technical language in our proposals, but sometimes you need to um, define your terms, um, help the, the peer reviewers and the National Council on the Humanities sort of understand your project. As, we, as I mentioned, address that review criteria use those use concrete examples that can really help um, as you say this will be of interest to um, scholars working in this discipline provide an example of how um, show them that you know sort of what you're doing that you have sort of uh, been working on this for a while or that you've brought together folks who are um, uh, working on different facets of this project project 
and do your best to anticipate and answer possible concerns. And that's where an NEH staff member can really help you out as well. We can sort of refocus you and say, you have eight pages and you spent seven pages on this one section and you have not left enough time to address all the other sections in the application. Um, we can provide that fresh set of eyes to, to, to remind you of that as well. So a few things about budget for those projects that have sort of budgets as opposed to say our, in, our individual awards, which are just sort of stipend awards. Budgets are very complicated and frankly federal budgets can be very complicated as well, particularly if you have um, various teams working under the project, if you have sub awards um, to uh, collaborators outside of your institution. So make sure you consult those budget guidelines, know what is and isn't allowed for that particular program. And it does vary by particular program. Talk to a program staff member. And then of course, of course, talk to your program officer, or excuse me, talk to your sponsored research office early in the process. Um, you should um, uh, make sure that they know you're going to apply to an NEH um, program. Do not go to them the day before the application is due um, and say, can you submit this on my behalf? Make sure you know what your uh, indirect cost rate is. They are um, experts in their field as well. Um, make sure that they are part of that conversation. I know I'm going a little long and I promise I'm almost done. If you can just hold on for me a little while longer, although this is being recorded, so you can also go back and, and consult the, the recording. We do wanna make sure you understand sort of the life of your application. Um, uh, as you submit your application and you're like, gosh, it takes a really long time for NEH to review. It's because we review so carefully. Um, we make sure that projects are eligible, that they're sorted into the right um, review panels with expert reviewers, then it goes up, up through the steps of the, of the chain. By law though, and this is where NEH differs from some other funding agencies, by law, our chairman is the only one who makes decisions. So everything leading up to that is strictly advisory. So that's something that I, I wanna make sure you, you understand about how NEH is different. Having said that though, I have been at the endowment for almost 26 years. The chairman um, looks very carefully at all of the advice that he or she gets um, to make those final um, recommendations. They, they lean heavily on the peer review panel, on the staff recommendations, on the national council to inform um, the, the final decisions. And then we have the award notification. And that's a nice, that's a nice time in, uh, and a nice day in, in the life of NEH staff members. It happens three times a year. Um, and um, just last week, we actually announced um, uh, uh, a set of awards. And that was a lovely day. But we are also aware that the days before that are sometimes some of our saddest days, because that's when we alert those that, are, um, that weren't funded. Um, as well. We know that um, funding uh, is very difficult to get from NEH. Some of our funding ratios are really quite low um, and we don't want you to give up on us because we won't give up on you. So post announcement, after the announcement, after you get the announcement of you got the award, congratulations, that means you have to be a careful steward of taxpayer dollars. But um, it also, uh, if you didn't get the award, we want to encourage you to request your reviewer comments. Just um, send us an email to the particular program. Make sure you contact a program officer if you have questions. And please think about revising and resubmitting. Um, it is often the case that a, an application with the benefit of peer review can be strengthened and, and resubmitted. Every application is treated as new at NEH, so there's no penalty for revising and resubmitting. Sometimes an applicant has to submit two or three times before they're funded. Um, but they also then have the benefit of, of peer reviewers to strengthen your application. So yes, when you get, when you get the, if you get the news that you weren't funded, be, be mad, be angry, um, but uh, take a moment um, and then uh, sit back and say, okay, what's next? And these are the things that are what's next. And that includes getting the comments, consulting a staff member and thinking about revising and resubmitting. And finally, I want to make sure you, um, uh, I, I introduce you to some programs, but I want to make sure you know that programs change at NEH over time. Um, we have new programs, we have new initiatives, we are going to be, we've launched a new initiative called A More Perfect Union um, uh, in the run up to the 250th anniversary of, of the United States. We want to make sure you know about uh, that special initiative. Um, make sure that your colleagues at your institution know of your areas of interest so they can keep an eye out for you as well. Make sure your Office of Sponsored Programs knows that you're interested in, in applying for grants. Make sure you follow the NEH accounts on social media. You can subscribe to NEH newsletters. 
and frankly, if I could sort of ask for your help, recommend our internship program. We pay our interns to your students. We um, have uh, applications three times a year. We've been able to do virtual ones these last rounds. Um, I don't know what's going to happen sort of going forward, but we've been really gratified with the virtual interns that we've had. They've been terrific. Um, and because they've been virtual, we've been able to have them from all around the country um, as well. They didn't have to come to Washington. Um, so where do you sign up for some of those uh, social media accounts? If you go to the main neh.gov um, website, um, right down at the very bottom on the right hand side, you'll see all of the, um, uh, of the little icons um, and the envelope one is the one for signing up to the newsletters and each office or division has a newsletter and then we have the main NEH newsletter. I promise we don't spam you. You get us maybe um, once, once or uh, twice a month. The Office of Digital Humanities usually does it quarterly, but it's a great way of finding out when new funding opportunities are posted and when new awards are announced as well. Um, so my two main takeaways, of course, grants are competitive, but you really are not going to get an award unless you apply. So you must apply to be considered. Um, and then, of course, that NEH program staff are here to help. Please keep in mind, we work for you. We are a federal government agency. We want to help you put together the most competitive application. We are keenly interested in strengthening the humanities across the country. And we know we do that through working with colleges and universities libraries, archives, um, uh, historical societies, museums, and you all are representatives of that. Um, and we also know that the humanities don't only happen in humanities uh, departments. They happen collaboratively. They often um, involve computer scientists working with historians, librarians working with um, uh, literature scholars. Um, and we want to make sure that you know that those sorts of projects um, fit well within the humanities remit as well. Um, and one more thing please sign up to serve as a peer reviewer. We always are looking for new perspectives, new voices, new expertise. Um, I, particularly in the Office of Digital Humanities, we have so many methodologies that fall under our purview. We're always looking for experts. So we often have folks from the College of, Colleges of Information or iSchools, as well as librarians who serve um, as, as our panelists. And you go back to the um, grants page and um, there's a, a link to become a peer reviewer as well. So you can get into our database so I can find you um, when I'm looking for panelists. Um, but this is my contact information. And I know we'll try to reserve some time for questions. I can see there's some chat um, questions going on. Um, when it says who, oh, let me pop up. Um, let me scroll down for questions. Um, hopefully, um, uh, we got folks interested. Um, if faculty are interested in creating a new digital humanities center, which of the grant programs, if any, would be appropriate for funding new initiatives? Well, it depends on sort of where you are within your, your campus and what sort of buy-in you have from leadership. Um, if you're interested in sort of institutional planning, you may want to take a look at the Humanities Initiatives Program. And as it becomes more mature, the planning for the Digital Humanities Center, take a look at the Challenge Grant Program um, to do both bricks and mortar to buy chairs and computer equipment um, for that. There's been a number of Digital Humanities Centers that have been supported in the last couple of years through the Challenge Grant Program. Um, in the 2000s, um, there were NEH summer seminars that were held abroad. Um, afterwards, I understand that a new rule meant that summer seminars that take place outside of the United States were no longer allowed. Do you know if that's still the case and if this rule might be reconsidered? Um, my understanding it is, is still the case. Um, I don't know if the rule is being reconsidered, but it's something um, we can ask our colleagues in the Division of Education programs. Um, uh, and that's one of the reasons to keep up with the NEH um, because things do change over time. Um, so my, my shorter answer is um, it is still not allowed, but um, uh, things are reconsidered all the time. And so it, it's worth um, sort of understanding uh, uh, that, that things may change. We have new leadership um, as well. Um, so so that, may, that may in fact change, but I, I, I have no, no insider knowledge on that as well. If one receives a humanities initiatives or connections grants, does this improve or decrease the chances of receiving an individual research fellowship for a separate project? Has no bearing whatsoever. Do keep in mind, you need to make sure that you time your, your projects correctly. You, you can certainly have multiple applications in at NEH for different projects. You can't apply to fund the same activities in different programs. But if you apply for an individual research fellowship and get it, you're expected to devote full time to that individual research project while you're on the fellowship. 
Um, so you wouldn't want to apply to direct a humanities initiative at the exact same time that you're applying for an individual research fellowship, unless you can figure out a way to sort of make the timing work. Um, so that's something that we can, it's a good problem to have, but it does not it decrease your chances of receiving an individual um, research fellowship for a separate project. Um, it is certainly the case that, that scholars have received awards at NEH from across different programs. Um, would this be applicable to the NEH NEA um, projects? Um, the, the university has a college of music. Um, it would be helpful to apply for NEH grants that cross NEA NEH boundaries. So something to think about for the College of Music, we can't do the performing arts. That's our sister agency, the Arts Endowment. But if you have a project that is building scaffolding around sort of a performing arts, um, it might be something that would go through our division of public programs. Or if you have faculty at the College of Music that is doing more interpretive research, ethnomusicology, history of music, that might be more appropriate for our division of research programs. So there are projects that and institutions that receive both funds from NEH and NEA, but for different elements of the overall project. Let's see. An award for this portal was just given to Kathy Hartman, Dean Emerita of the Library and my dear neighbor, Portal Tex uh, Texas History, that is. Congratulations. Hooray. Um, who are the staff that make the staff recommendations? Well, I'm one of them. It's the program officers who chair the panels. And what we do is once the panels are over for a particular program, we look across the panels and we say, well, we have this much money. How far can we go down on the list of recommended based on what our peer review panelists said? Um, we have to, um, in some ways, make sure that um, we are representing sort of all the humanities disciplines, all the regions of the world. We want to make sure that um, uh, we understand the, the criticisms of the panelists. Some panels are really tough graders. Some disciplines are really tough graders. And we want to make sure we take that into account as well. Um, and that's why when you're asked to serve as a peer reviewer, we look very carefully at not only what your grade is, but what your comments are as well. The comments are even more important than your, your grade. So um, we, that's why we also ask you to address the review criteria very carefully in your, in your peer review comments. But the staff recommendations are really to reconcile what all the peer reviewers have done for that particular program um, uh, to make those staff recommendations. Let's see. Will students like PhD students be able to apply for research grants? I'm afraid not. Um, not for fellowships and not, not to direct collaborative research or scholarly additions. Institutional awards, um, they certainly can be part of a project. Um, particularly in the Office of Digital Humanities, we have both graduate students and undergraduates who participate very successfully in our projects. Um, uh, in fact, it's a great opportunity for students to understand what it means to work on a collaborative team. But look very carefully at the particular notice of funding opportunity to see if graduate students can be paid for from grant funds for that particular project. Um, but I can tell you right right now that graduate students are not eligible to apply for our, our individual awards, not for summer stipends, not for fellowships. But you've done what we hope many graduate students do, which is get prepared early so that when you are done with your graduate program, you know the NEH is available to fund that first book or that, that first series of articles or to work on that first collaborative team. Um, can grants for um, Hispanic serving institutions be about anything? For example, can you study Native American history? Absolutely. That is very squarely within the humanities. If you have a collaborative project with, with your fellow colleagues on Native American history at your campus, um, uh, that project can um, very much be within that, the purview. And we've, we have examples of that. And if you search that database of funded projects, you'll pull up lots of examples in that space. Let's see, I think I've gone through all the questions in the chat. Now's your opportunity. I know we're a little bit over, but now's your opportunity to add in any additional ones as well. Um, and so the takeaways of course are, um, uh, make sure you apply to us when you're ready for your project and talk to an NEH staff member beforehand. I know it can be very, um, uh, it can be an, a little, either intimidating or infuriating to send to um, uh, an email address like odh at neh.gov and you think, They'll, there's no one that will answer that. I'm just sending this email out into the ether. Well, the case of the matter is NEH staff 
do answer those emails. I, I am one of the, the folks responsible for answering the ODH at NEH.gov email address. There are people behind those email addresses and you should feel very comfortable um, getting in touch with us. Um, calling us right now is a little bit more difficult. We're still all working from home, but feel free to use that email. And oftentimes I will get an email and then I'll write back and say, let's, let's have a phone call. Um, and I want you to, to feel comfortable writing to all of my colleagues. I, I miss seeing them dearly um, every day, but we are still in touch and I know they are also working hard to respond to all of folks who are, who are writing to us as well. Um, I'm asking specifically about the grant that requires um, humanities in combination with another field in my question regarding NEA, NEH. That may be the humanities comment or the humanities connections program. Um, are, there's not a grant program. We are not partnering with NEA and any um, NEH. What we are partnering with is NEH and the Arts and Humanities Research Council of the UK. Um, and that's sort of the UK program. I hope, I hope um, we're thinking of the same program. Right now, we don't have a joint funding opportunity with our sister agency here in the United States. We actually have a joint funding opportunity with our sister agency um, outside of the United States. Um, no, the one that combined humanities and sciences. Oh, that, that I think is the humanities commons. Um, it can be art history. Yes, it can be art and art history um, as well. But that's one that you'll also wanna talk with my colleagues um, in our division of education programs to ensure that um, you are able to, um, I'm not sure, it, it would have to be led by the humanities. Um, uh, and that's where I wanna make sure that I have you talk with my colleagues in the, um, in the education division to make sure the balance of activities are squarely within the humanities. We can't have it, we can't have it um, be seen as um, art first, it has to be humanities first, but it can sort of have a, a range of activities around it as well. So, um, uh, but, but it, it, it's absolutely worth having a conversation with my colleagues. Um, and if you, if you get in touch with me, I can refer you to one of my colleagues in that, in that division to, to talk about your project. Um, so yeah, and I promise I also answer that email address as well. So that, that's my personal NEH email address. So you should feel free to, to answer, to write to me. Um, are there any other questions? Um, I hope this was helpful, if only to get you started and to think about where you fit within the NEH and to keep to have you keep coming back to the NEH as well, um, to, to, to think of yourself as part of the NEH family. Jennifer, this was really terrific. I thank you so very much. And as you know, we have recorded it um, and we will make this available. We'll be back in touch with you about the recording, but uh, thank you so oh, very absolutely. much. Oh, absolutely. It's been my pleasure. And Dr. Wheeler, thank you so much for um, reaching out and making this possible. It was wonderful that you also reached out beyond the University of North Texas. I think that speaks to the leadership of the University of North Texas within your region um, and, and your willingness to, to, um, to, to be the host for this, an event sort of this, um, like this. Um, and maybe one day we can do it in person as well. <laughs> so, uh, but, but thank you again for inviting NEH and for reaching out to, to your, your fellow institutions in the region. Um, well, and I enjoyed you. speaking with all of you. Um, thank you for, for sticking with us. We went about 15 minutes over. Um, I had so much to say and so much to share with you all, um, but I appreciate you all sticking in with me. Thank you, and I'm sure you'll be hearing from lots of us. Oh, absolutely, <laughs> great. Well, that's what we want. That's what that's what it's that's what we're here for. So, all right. thank you all very much. Um, I'll stick around just a bit as everyone logs off in case there are any additional okay. questions. All right. So um, it seems like then, Jennifer, that that uh, these international collaborations, other than the one with the UK, where you've got something you know formal settled, the people who propose um, projects they need to have more to do with um, you know what's of interest in in America rather than it, it doesn't necessarily. Um, I will say project international projects um, can involve collaborators from outside of the United States on an NEH funded project. So a, for example, one of the archaeology projects um, is on a site in Egypt and they have scholars um, from Egypt as part of it. What we can't do is do a sub award to a college or university outside of the United States because then it gets a little sticky. But what we can do is fund um, uh, as scholarly consultants scholars from outside of the United States on a project. So it can be a scholar working on a topic in the United States, but it also can be um, scholars in the United States or a team in the United States that are working on a topic um, not related to the United States 
but want to um, also collaborate with their their peers outside of the United States as well. We have lots of examples of that um, Great. as well. And particularly in the Office of Digital Humanities, where so much of digital humanities um, is, is uh, uh, international or, or, or cross country. Um, so there's, there's exciting work happening everywhere. Uh, yes, um, I have sent my slides to the, the team at the University of North Texas, so they will be making the slides available as well. Absolutely. Um, any other questions? Let's see how many folks are left. Is it just us? Oh, no, there's still 30, 30 uh, folks. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Versus. Uh, perhaps working directly with your office. Um, so. I think you're speaking about the, the summer stipends program. They are not able to read drafts because they get so many applications for that program, but it's worth um, getting in touch with my colleagues in that division and ask what their recommendations are for that. Um, uh, so th they may have a greater sense of sort of the program as a whole as well. Um, so um, it's worth uh, working with, uh, or at least reaching out, just uh, submitting a question um, and, and seeing if they're able to have a conversation with you um, about that question. But the fact that you made it through um, one of two submitted to uh, the NEH speaks well to your project. Um, it, uh, that program is uh, the Office of Summer, the Summer Stipends Program is one of the most competitive of the programs. So um, it's worth uh, uh, getting in touch with them to ask. Any others? Everyone's just hanging out. It's like coffee hour. <laughs> <laughs> we all like to. Um... Is that. Um... Oh gosh, what was it called? Uh, digging into data, is that something that still exists? It, it doesn't. Um, there, the Transatlantic Partnership has had a couple of other competitions. And in fact, they just announced one um, that's related to COVID that might be of interest particularly to the iSchool. Um, the NEH is not participating in that, that call for participants, but the National Science Foundation is um, through their SBE program. So it's worth taking a look at it if you go to the Transatlantic platform. And let me see if I can actually I'm going to about to go live, which is always um, uh, a little sketchy, but uh, I have the NSF call pulled up right here, their dear colleague letter for that program. Let's see. No, that's not it. Okay. Uh, NSF. And if I remember correctly, that would be a partner in, in South America or Mexico, Canada, and then somewhere across the seas, like it, well, and it's different this round um, because they have different partners, different countries uh, volunteer to uh, participate in different, um, here we go, uh, different calls under the transatlantic platform. So let me post, let me pop in here um, and in the chat, oh, here's the, this is the call um, right there for um, what they're doing. And NSF is the, the lead US agency for that. Um, but I think it would be of uh, tremendous interest to um, folks in the iSchool. They may have some projects underway. Perfect. Thank you. So if you could share that with your colleagues, that would be um, much appreciated. And this one is being, um, you submit the application um, to the Sao Paulo research. So Brazil is taking the lead on that. Okay. For digging into data, NEH sort of took the lead on um, shepherding the, the review process. But for, for this one, the Brazilian agency um, is for it. And you can see a range of different um, uh, 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 projects. So now they've brought in um, the Republic of South Africa. There's also additional countries that weren't as part of the digging into data program. So that's nice to see. There was a question about uh, specific contact, contact for the Summer Stipends Office. Sure, let me, um, I'm gonna give you, even though I'm giving you the main number, I'm giving you the main number because there are several folks who work on that program um, and you'll wanna get the one that is, uh, the one that's available right now. So I would write to that um, uh, address um, with that question. That's a good question. Thank you. Because, because they read out, they've read thousands of those over time and sat in on um, and, and, and seen lots of panels. So they will have a sense of uh, what's uh, preferable for the panelists and what makes a stronger application. And the samples that are available um, are also, um, do they have samples here? No, they have just, oh yeah, they do have samples here um, that will give you a, a sense of the voices that were used in, in various applications. 
Okay. I think we're all afraid to, to miss out on some <laughs> kernel of wisdom. So <laughs> well, um, then I will be bold. I'm going to stop sharing um, and um, uh, I will be bold and leave so that you guys can all stay and talk about me if you'd like. <laughs> well, all right. Well, then on behalf of the College of Information then, and, um, you know, the University of North Texas, we just want to thank you. And oh, absolutely. To talk to you again with project ideas, you yes, and absolutely. your colleagues at, at NEH. So thanks very much. Yeah, thank you all very much. It was a, it was a pleasure to, to meet all of you, if only virtually. <laughs>